First, that the state exists to preserve individual freedom. Second, that separation of governmental powers is critical to our Constitution. And third, that the judiciary exists to state what the law is, not what the law should be. And this includes advocating for these principles whenever, regardless of our Our topic today is the intersection of the where Congress expressed interest in information about creating explosive devices. To discuss these issues, and we have Professor Josh Blackman and Sean at the South Texas College of Law. Black was selected and law and policy. He has to testify twice before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and health care. He is an adjunct scholar at the PLC. Professor Blackman is the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the internet's premier Supreme Court at joshblackman.com. Legal analytics of Lex Predict as the director of judicial research. Professor Blackman is also an author of over three dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, LA Times, and other national publications. Our second speaker is Sheldon Gilbert, a longtime constitutional litigator who has represented clients in nearly 100 cases at the Supreme Court. Sheldon has extensive experience in and administrative law. He's been involved in some of the most significant Supreme Court cases in the last decade in these areas, such as NLRB versus Canning and UARG et al. versus EPA. He frequently speaks to audiences across the country on constitutional law and the history of the Supreme Court. Previously, Sheldon served as the director of the Institute for Justice's Center for Judicial Engagement, where he educated As a litigator with the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center, he represented the U.S. Chamber in over 400 cases in federal and state courts addressing a wide range of legal issues, from free speech to property rights. He has also taught as a prof professorial lecturer at the George Washington University Law School. The format for our event for today will be each of our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes, and the rest will be left over for Q&A. That. Thanks, Jude. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all so much. My first time here at Temple. It's great to be here. It's snowing outside, but I appreciate the cold and warm. Welcome. You are all in for a treat today. You get not only one constitutional right, you get two constitutional rights. The intersection of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment and 3D printed guns. Has Anyone here ever used a 3D printer? Yeah, what'd you make? A train, a train. yeah, kind of like this? Like that really should be oh, <laughs> see, these are, these are trial lawyers, right? You get smart. Uh, anyone else? All right, 3D printing is a fairly new technology, but it's premised on an old idea. If you develop an idea in your head and I designed it on a computer, you can then create it in reality. Maybe a train, I have a picture of a train ready. Or actually, hold on, I have a race car, still not a train. So you have a car, you have a house, and lots of other complicated objects. And the basic idea of 3D printing is you tell a computer what you want to create, and you do this with basic coding. Now, uh, I don't presume you've ever used coding before. I'll give you a very brief Tutorial, okay? Let's say I want to make a cylinder, like a can of soda, for example, right? 
If I tell you the cylinder has a radius of five inches and a height of 20, you know what that cylinder looks like, simple geometry. Code works in the exact same fashion. If I tell a computer, create a cylinder with a height of 20 and a radius of five, it makes something that looks like that, okay? It's that simple. You use plain words that anyone would understand and you tell a computer what to generate. And you can use this process to create a wide range of objects in all shapes and sizes. This is what a 3D printer looks like. It's actually making not a train, but a race car. Okay? And let's walk through how this works. So has everyone ever made a candle before, right? How do you make a candle? You take a wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax, you pull it out, and you keep dipping it one after another after another. And each time you dip it in, it gets a little thicker around the base. Right? That's how a candle is made. 3D printing works in a very similar fashion. But instead of dipping a wick into wax, you spray plastic, a very thin layer of plastic of different shapes and sizes. So this is what it looks like. You have a nozzle and it sprays a little bit of plastic at a time, and here it's creating a ball. And what happens, the nozzle moves around, and the actual bed, what you're printing onto, also moves around, so you can create objects different shapes and sizes. Sometimes you have it spraying like this, where the bed is actually heated, so that the plastic solidifies quicker. Okay, make sense? I want to show you now a demonstration. My good friend Shelbert says I need to bring, I'm sorry, Sheldon says I need to bring uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an actual 3D printer, I think it's a little too bulky. So I'll show a, I'll show a picture, okay? So we're printing here an object. When you see what the object is, shout it out, okay? So here's picture number one. You start with this basic honeycomb lattice, right? A basic frame. So layer one, layer two, layer three. Layer four, anyone see it? Layer five. See, so it keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more intricate, right? Okay, try a temple. Layer six. You got it. That's impressive. People usually get at this one, right? But you got it here. Good job, Jude. Wow, very good. So you got Yoda, right? So here, seven, eight, not, now you see it, right? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, boom, done, right? So in maybe 15 or 20 minutes, you can create a lifelike representation of anything you want. Now, I'm not artistic. Are you guys artistic? No, you're in law school, right? <laughs> I can't paint, I can't sculpt. If you gave me a piece of clay, I couldn't make this. If you gave me a piece of stone, I couldn't chisel this. If you gave me a piece of wood, I couldn't shave this. But if you gave me a 3D printer, I could make it and so could you. And that's the promise of 3D printing, to use your mind to design products, to create things that you may otherwise be able to create. Now, I'm not here because people are 3D printing Yoda, right? That's not very uh, uh, noteworthy. I'm here because we're in America and what people want to print, guns, of course, right? So our story starts today with a product known as the Liberator, the Liberator, okay? The Liberator was the first 3D printed gun. This is the visual representation of the barrel of a gun, right? The barrel is the thing that the bullet flies out of. Now I played a trick on you before, right? I showed you how to make a cylinder using 3D printers. A barrel of a gun is a cylinder. Ah, I see I'm getting that, right? So I showed you how to make a, a gun part. Oh, actually, you, funny story, your attorney general tried suing me, but well, I'll, get, I'll get to a little bit later. Um, they all sued me, everyone sues me. I, New York, Jersey, everyone, everyone's suing me, right? But this is the Barrel of the Liberator. This is a group called Defense Distributed, based in Austin, Texas. And I've represented them since 2015 in a number of lawsuits against federal and now state governments challenging the ability to work with 3D guns. So who knows what this is? 
Who knows what this is? Yeah. Very good, yeah. This is an AR-15 lower receiver. This is the guts of a gun, right? The, the government only cares about this one part of the AR-15. Everything else is basically a paperweight. Um, defense distributed found a way of printing the lower receiver. So you can basically buy the remaining parts from a gun kit on eBay and print one of these and now you have an AR-15. Government has no record of it. They also were able to 3D print magazines. That is the box that holds bullets. But what put defense distributed on the national map was this. What the heck is this? These are the individual parts used to make a liberator. The blue thing is the handle. This is the frame. This little thing is the barrel. That's the bullet. A nail is used as a firing pin. Basically, you jam a nail in the back of a bullet, it goes boom. The little squiggly thingies, those are the springs used to pull back and recoil and strike the gun. But all of these parts, with the exception of a common nail and a simple bullet, can be made using a 3D printed gun. This is what it looks like fully assembled. Now, uh, if you look over here, you see a rope, right? You don't answer. We talked about this at lunch. Why is there a rope there? You don't want to guess? Why, why is there a rope next to the gun? Well, let me disabuse you and the Trin Jones Shapiro of a common fact. Plastic guns suck. Um, the reason why guns are made out of metal is because steel has unique properties. When steel heats up, it expands. And when steel cools, it contracts, right? That's a very important aspect of a gun. When you press it, it gets really hot, and then it cools off, right? Plastic doesn't do that. When plastic heats up, it breaks. When plastic cools down, it breaks, right? You ever put like a piece of plastic in the freezer, it cracks. It doesn't, it doesn't last very long. It's not very durable. So the entire notion of a plastic gun is very stupid. These are not efficient guns, not effective. They break, they're fragile, and they're likely to blow up in your hand, which is why the rope is there. When they were testing it, they would put a rope on the trigger, stand very far away, and yank it to see if the trigger didn't blow the damn thing up. But eventually, they figured out how to make this in a safe fashion. I don't have to bore you with it, but you have to treat the barrel with this acetone bath, right? And you gotta get it just right to harden the plastic enough that it can handle a combustion, but so it doesn't get too hard so that it cracks wide open, right? So it's a very hard, no pun intended, but it's a very hard device to make. So is there a problem, right? Is there anything illegal about printing a 3D gun? Um, I'm gonna limit my answer to federal law. There's a state law that might be on point that we're in court about right now, but I'll leave my answer to the federal law. First off, when I say 3D printed guns, this is what your politicians want to think, right? You press a button and these guns pop out. This is not how things work. There's a long tradition in this country of making zip guns. Who knows what a zip gun is? A zip gun. A zip gun is a homemade gun made from parts you can get anywhere. Let me show you one. What is this? It's a garden hose and a soldering iron. It's also a gun. I can go to Home Depot and buy $10 of the parts to make a fully functional handgun very quickly. I found these on the internet. These are lovely. These are flashlight keychains that were repurposed into guns. You don't need much to make a firearm. And I'll tell you, this is a lot more lethal than the plastic gun. You say, wait a minute, Josh, those all involve metal. Okay, you can make a rifle out of a piece of rubber tubing, which will not trigger metal detector. And I want to show you a demonstration. But please, do not try this at home. These guys with their flip phone camera are idiots. They were doing, they were doing something very dumb. Don't repeat it, but I want to show you how easy it is to make an undetectable firearm that doesn't require a thousand dollar printer and lots of expertise in plastic manufacturing. Okay, so here's what's going on. They're gonna use this plastic, this rubber tube and a shotgun shell to make a gun. How? At the end of this pipe is a little dimple. Okay, something sharp. They're gonna load this red shotgun shell into the pipe and they're gonna jam the pipe into the back of the shotgun shell. Now, I want you to study this picture very carefully. What's wrong with this picture? There's a lot wrong. Give me, give me a couple things. What's wrong? Just shout it out. There's an electrical outlet. Right 
Oh my goodness. There is an outlet right there plugged into a fan. Here. This picture you see a little bit more carefully. So they're inside. They're about to fire a bullet, a shotgun shell, into the wall with an electrical wire coming down, plugged into a fan. And you can see there are lots of holes on this box. They've done it before. Also, his hand is right over the barrel. So the level of stupid going on here is very high, right? Anyway, let's proceed. <laughs> so they pull the trigger, right? One, two, boom. Made a rifle. They made a rifle with a rubber tube, completely undetectable. This is far more lethal than anything that DD, Defense Tribute, has ever made. Here they're all proud with their smoke shotgun shell because he had spent. They fired it. Now, again, I don't show you this to give you ideas of what to do on the weekend, right? Don't do this. This is dumb. Right? Firing a gun inside is a very bad idea. I do this to suggest that, as insane as it sounds, it's legal under federal law. Our good friends at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms have recognized that as long as you make your own gun and you don't put it into commerce, that is, you don't sell it, you're fine. You can't make machine guns and short barrel shotguns, but as a general matter, you can make your own weapons. So then what's the problem, right? Under federal law, there's no ban on making your guns. New Jersey has recently tried to ban the manufacturer. We're going to get there eventually in court, I suppose. But the immediate threat concerns is federal law opposing this. So in fact, the problem with defense distributor was not the fact they made the guns. The problem was that they put on the internet the files used to make the gun. And in 2013, the Obama administration took the position that it's illegal to put these files on the internet. That putting the files on the internet was itself illegal. And that's where we came in. Um, back in 2014, I wrote an article suggesting that the Obama administration was violating the First and Second Amendment by restricting access to these files. Um, after I wrote that article, uh, Cody Wilson, who was a founder of Defense Distributed, hired me and a team of lawyers, and we sued the State Department. He said, Josh, I want to hire you to sue the government. Like, sign me up. So we sued the State Department, and uh, we lost in the district court. We had divided opinion in the Court of Appeals. We had a narrowly divided opinion in the en banc court. We lost. And they went to Supreme Court, and we lost there, denied cert. But then we went back to the trial court, and the government decided to settle our case. So that case is still lingering. I'll get back to where it is right now. But I want to walk through the legal arguments. First off, let's talk about the First Amendment. It's a very basic bedrock principle of our legal system that the government can't stop you from speaking. Specifically, they can't censor your speech on the basis of content. And we've argued in this litigation that the limitation on 3D printed guns is a content-based restriction. They're saying this type of 3D code is fine, but that type of files are not fine. And when you have a content-based restriction, it's subject to strict scrutiny. Now you might say, wait a minute, Josh. This isn't like political speech or anything you know, normal. This is speech how to do dangerous stuff. Well, who here has heard of the anarchist cookbook? People raising their hand, my kind of people, right? This is a terrorist handbook, right? This book has instructions of how to make bombs, how to make poison, how to kidnap people, how to do really bad stuff. And if you follow these instructions, you can engage in serious acts of harming others. So the mere fact that your speech may be used to facilitate harm or crime doesn't by itself allow the government to restrict it. But then you might say, wait a minute, Josh. We're not talking about a book here. We're talking about code. My friends, information is speech. The mere fact that you choose to express yourself on the internet rather than through books and paper and paint and pencil does not deprive it of First Amendment value, right? We live in a world of zeros and ones. All of this is protected by the, by the Constitution. And in a case called Sorel v. IMS Health, the court held that both the creation 
and dissemination of information are speech. Okay? So we have code, we have speech, it's all protected. But I promise you not only one constitutional amendment, I promise you two, which brings us to the second amendment. The second amendment provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Written about a mile that way, Sheldon? Which uh, way my point? Where's Independence Hall? No sense of direction. That mile that way. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so we are in the hometown of the second amendment. Right? And the irony that your AG tried shutting us down, but I'll, I'll let that one go. We'll come back to that later. And in 2008, the court decided DCV Heller. DCV Heller. And this case held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Two years later, in a case called McDonald v. City of Chicago, the court held that the Second Amendment limits not only federal action, but by virtue of the 14th Amendment, it limits state action. So Chicago's handgun ban was declared unconstitutional. Since Heller and McDonald, the Supreme Court has basically said, nah, not interested, right? They haven't taken a single important Second Amendment case in years. So we have to sort of extrapolate. And I argue that there are two aspects of the Second Amendment that are relevant to our case, right? The first is the right to acquire arms. Imagine the government passes a law saying, if you have a gun, you can keep it, but you can't buy any new guns, right? I think that law would violate the Second Amendment. Right? There's a right to acquire arms by some means. Now, it can be regulated. I'm not saying there can't be any restrictions on it, but there's a basic right to acquire arms. Okay? The second right that's relevant is a right to make arms, and that's what I'm actually more confident about. Long before there was Cabela's and Dick's Sporting Goods, people in this country had to make their own weapons. During the time of the American Revolution, you couldn't order a firearm through a catalog. You made your own damn gun. So there's a very deeply rooted and long-standing tradition of Americans manufacturing their own firearms. If you ever see the John Adams miniseries, which I love, there's a scene where Abigail Adams is making musket balls. I love that scene. But anyway, yeah, there's a good tradition. So, at least at some level, prohibitions on 3D printed guns implicate the Second Amendment. I'll leave it there just somewhat vague. Why is that important? Constitutional laws recognize the concept of hybrid rights. Well, one right reinforces another right. So imagine the government passes a law that says it's a crime to wish someone a Merry Christmas, an actual war on Christmas, right? Um, would that violate free speech or would that law violate free exercise? Or would it violate both? I think both, right? The rights reinforce each other. Or here's another example. Let's say the government passed a law banning books that teach you how to perform abortions. Will that violate the freedom of speech or maybe the 14th Amendment's due process clause, liberty interest? I think might actually violate both. Here, in our case, what we have is the government is censoring people about sharing information of how to make a gun. They're literally censoring the Second Amendment. They're banning information used to make firearms. And I think that the First and the Second Amendment reinforce each other in a very important way. It makes an even greater right that we should be even more suspicious when the government's trying to censor another constitutionally protected right. Okay? So what does a law look like today? We have a law in the books called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was passed in 1988. When? But probably none of you were even born yet, except for me and Sheldon, right? 1988. Wait a minute, Josh. I thought you said the first 3D gun came out in 2013. Why was Congress in 1988 worried about this? Let me tell you something. Undetectable guns are not new. This law makes it a crime to have a gun without a certain quantity of metal in it necessary to trigger a metal detector. Why was Congress freaked out about pla you know, plastic guns in the 1980s? I blame the Glock handgun, which is a very good gun. I, I own one. Um, but I also blame Bruce Willis in the Die Hard movies. Bruce Willis said in one of these movies, I'll read this to you, right? And it was a Christmas movie. Bruce Willis said in a Die Hard movie, he said, luggage. That punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Everything he said is false. Everything, right? There is no Glock 7. It doesn't exist. They're not made of porcelain. They're made out of metal. They're not made in Germany. They're made in Austria. It will show up in an x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. But Congress reacts to movies, and they ban stuff they see in movies. So that's what we have, right? This law has been in the books now for 30 years. Uh, uh, 
it still is, it still has effect, but <laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis. So there have been recent efforts to try to ban 3D printed guns. Senator Schumer of New York tries to ban everything. Uh, he tried banning this, he wasn't able to, uh, but he tried. Perhaps you say, well, maybe Josh, if we have such a risk of plastic guns, maybe we should restrict the materials used to make it. Let's, let's ban plastic, okay? Guess what, guys, you can 3D print metal. This is a 1911 handgun, fully 3D printed. Cost about $40,000, not cheap. You can buy a gun like this, a couple of blocks away from maybe 300 bucks, right? But you can 3D print metal. Of course, this is detectable. So the government, I think, has recognized that actually banning the printing of these is foolish. New Jersey tried, but I think they, you know, they, 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 they recognize it's hard to actually ban the printing. So instead they say we need to ban the sharing of information to make one. At least the federal government had a statute they sought to rely on, which involved export control laws. Now you may not know this, but if you want to send certain types of technology overseas, you need the permission of the federal government. And this makes sense, right? We have a, we have a law called ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. If I want to send a Stinger missile to Afghanistan, you know, I think it makes sense to get the government's permission before I do that. If I want to send the blueprints of how to manufacture a nuclear submarine to China, we probably want the government's input in that sort of decision. But what if we're putting online speech in the public domain, open source code that's available to anyone? Never before the government tried applying these sort of restrictions to code in the public domain until our case. And in 2013, the Obama State Department sent a letter to my client, Defense Distributed, and warned it that says you are in violation of export control law. They didn't mail anything, but they put files on the internet used to make certain gun parts. And they ordered them to take down these files immediately. Just, I want to take a step back. I don't really care what you think about guns or 3D guns. You have a letter from the State Department telling a US citizen to take a file off the internet. That is remarkable, stunning. And the silence of advocates on this point will not touch our case with a 10-foot pole, which was unfortunate. The ACLU basically abandoned one-tenth of the Bill of Rights a long time ago. So I mentioned we went to the Supreme Court. The case went back to the district court. We reached a settlement. On the eve of the settlement, the blitz began. First, the gun, con the gun control groups. The Brady campaign, every time for gun violence, and Gabby Giffords, they sued us seeking a temporary restraining order to block our settlement. I argued that TRO motion and I prevailed. We actually got the settlement in effect. That evening, we put all the files online and they would be there for about three days. And the files were downloaded by thousands of people around the world. Two days later, we get sued by the Pennsylvania Attorney General, your Attorney General Shapiro. And he sought a temporary restraining order against us. He wanted an ex parte TRO and the judge came in on a Sunday and scheduled oral argument on a Sunday afternoon. I was on the road. I actually argued the case from the United Lounge at LaGuardia Airport, quite possibly the worst airport in the United States. And I won. I told the judge, the judge, look, deny the TRO will block all Pennsylvania IP addresses. So we built what we called our blue wall. We basically walled off blue states from accessing the internet. This is like North Korea stuff. No one does this. We actually figured out how to do this pretty quickly. Then shortly thereafter, we got sued by the New Jersey Attorney General. He went to state court. He sought a nationwide injunction against us in state chancery court. <laughs> I argued that one also. I said, Your Honor, with respect, I don't think you have the jurisdiction to enter a nationwide injunction in state court. He's like, you might be right. But I told the judge, look, judge, we'll block New Jersey IP addresses and will block mobile internet access, will wall off New Jersey. He said, fine, you deny the TRO. So far, so good. I'm like, three, three for three, right? Go Josh, right? Then it gets worse. So later that afternoon, I have to argue in Seattle, a federal district court. We were sued by originally nine, but eventually 20 states. And they started a temporary restraining order against us to take down the files. So I argued the case. I'm up there making my arguments. I was up there for about 20 minutes arguing. And the judge asked me one question and one question only. He asked, do you represent all the parties? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah. He's like, okay, that's all you need to know because he's gonna rule against me. And then he ruled from the bench against me. 
He entered in an injunction telling the government they had to rescind our license. And because our license was rescinded, we had to take down the files. But for a good three and a half days, the files were in the public domain and they're out there. They're everywhere. You can find them in five seconds. The litigation goes on. We're currently still fighting against uh, Washington and Seattle District Court. Uh, we've also brought uh, a 1983 action against the New Jersey Attorney General, the Pennsylvania Attorney General, the Delaware Attorney General, and the New York Governor. Basically, everyone East Coast, right? We got basically from New York down to Delaware, got them all in the lawsuit. Uh, we recently started a TRO against them, it was denied. We'll move for a preliminary injunction at some point. Uh, but this is an ongoing litigation. At some point, this will go to the Supreme Court. Um, I think it will in the next year or so. Uh, I think we'll get a favorable judgment from the Fifth Circuit, lose the ninth, and get a nice split to tee this up. So by way of background, this is a long-running case. Um, in fact, this year at Harvard Law School, the Ames Moot Court competition, their big moot court, is actually based on our case. And it's surreal to see that these students are arguing the stuff we're arguing in court, young law students. So I'm grateful that we've made an impact here. Um, I'll stop talking here uh, and turn over to my good friend Sheldon from the National Constitution Center. And I'll welcome your questions later. Thank you all so much. Sheldon, you can clap. All right. So um, Josh mentioned I'm from the National Constitution Center. I want to get in a plug very quickly that we're looking for really bright uh, students for internships the coming semester. So if you're interested, let me know. We've got a lot of really fun and interesting constitutional issues that we're researching. And we always have uh, amazing and interesting speakers that are coming that you will get a chance to uh, to meet and be involved with, so uh, please do reach out afterwards if you have an interest in an internship with the National Constitution Center. Um, now, Josh uh, gave a really fascinating discussion on the special problem of regulations or bans on the distribution of information about 3D printed guns, right? And that's a, and, and he, he makes a, a, a very interesting and compelling case that, the, that uh, this is protected under the First and Second Amendment. Um, but I think it's worth taking a step back and thinking about the question of 3D printed guns, not by itself, but in the broader context of changes to the way we think about and discuss issues of free speech and the internet. And what the consequences are uh, for our society and for our legal culture for what some have called the democratization of speech, or uh, what uh, some like Professor Eugene uh, Volokh has called the, the rise of cheap speech, right? Uh, at its core, I think what's going on with the 3D printed guns case, it's not, it's not even the new 3D technology, right, that's triggering the imagination and concern of many individuals. It's the fact that anybody in any classroom anywhere can easily put this type of information online and distribute it very quickly, right? So Josh said that in that three-day window of time, when those files were online, even if they came off, off the internet three days later, uh, they were everywhere, right? And it's this, uh, the democratization of, of speech or the rise of cheap speech that has a lot of people worried. And it's not just issues like 3D printed guns, right? Uh, just throwing it out there, what, what are some of the issues you've seen in the news where people have expressed concern about uh, information being shared online, right? What are, what are some that have you, you've seen in the news recently? Jude? Fake news. Fake news during the election, right? Oh no, anybody with, uh, with a laptop can create a website that looks like a news website and share fake news and it could affect elections, right? That's a great example. Any other examples that you've seen recently uh, about concerns about free speech in the internet? Yeah? Right, so, so foreign actors have the same access to American uh, markets and American individuals to share their speech as anybody else. As Josh said, you know, once it's on the internet, uh, it's, uh, it transcends boundaries and it's hard to kind of keep information uh, locked up in one place. Um, some other examples, so the internet gives us wonderful things like uh, cute cat videos, right? Um, but on the other hand, we get uh, products like Backpage, right? and sex trafficking through the internet. Uh, and that's a serious concern, and people are worried about 
uh, how the internet is, and, and cheap use of the internet and anonymity on the internet can facilitate all sorts of terrible practices like sex trafficking, right? Um, uh, we have uh, the rapid spread of news and information with tools like Twitter. I remember when uh, there was a, an earthquake in DC and everybody, you know, the ground starts shaking. My office was just right across from the White House. Uh, and a lot of people who had been in Washington, DC when 9-11 happened, you know, the, the building starts shaking and what do you think? One of the first thing you, thinks, you think is, oh my gosh, is this another terrorist attack, right? And I remember so many of us went to Twitter to find out what the heck was going on, right? Because it's a good mechanism for getting information out very quickly. Uh, on the other hand, it's a good mechanism for getting information out very quickly, right? Have you heard of, uh, of these AI-generated video and audio? Uh, sometimes they're called deep fakes, right? But uh, the concept of a, of a deep fake is, and you may have seen some of these on the news, where you can take video of uh, President Obama and audio of President Obama, and you plug it into some software, and you, you type out what you want President Obama to say instead of whatever it is he said, and all of a sudden you have a video of President Obama making fun of Joe Biden, right? And it looks like President Obama, it sounds like President Obama. Now, admittedly, it's kind of like the 3D printed gun, it's kind of a little bit hokey right now, and you can kind of tell it's fake. But there is a sense that these type of deep fakes where the video and the audio look very real could become a serious threat uh, to, uh, to uh, democracy in the near future if people can't tell what's real and fake uh, very quickly. So imagine a, a deep fake uh, the night before an election where a candidate uh, looks like he's saying something absolutely horrific against a particular demographic, right? Between that video coming out on the morning of the election uh, and the time it takes to figure out that it's a fake to rebut the, re rebut the information about the, the video, um, the election might very well be over, right? And, and so people are very genuinely concerned about what the implications are for the democratization of, of, uh, of, of speech and the rise of cheap speech. And I, I worry that uh, those of us who are very concerned about free speech rights and, uh, and protecting these rights uh, can fall into the trap of not taking seriously enough just how deeply concerned people are about this problem of the rise of cheap speech, of the, of the ability for information to spread rapidly, uh, and the, the reality that the truth often can't catch up with the lie. Uh, those of us who care about protecting rights need to take these concerns that people have seriously. Um, and, and I think that brings us to a question about how we defend uh, constitutional rights uh, and how we help people understand it's important to protect constitutional rights like free speech, particularly and even when there are various ser very serious dangers that, uh, that, that are potentially at play. How do we convince people to protect free speech rights in that context? Um, I want to take a second and kind of go back to first principles and and take the Wayback Machine and go back in time uh, to understand uh, what we might call the Madisonian dilemma of constitutional democracy, right? So James Madison, um, before the Constitutional Convention, uh, is kind of getting ready and studying for the Constitutional Convention, right? And he's looking through a lot of different sources. Uh, Randy Barnett's uh, recent book, Our Republican Constitution, has a great chapter on this moment in time before the Constitutional Convention when James Madison is getting ready for the convention. And James Madison uh, prepares these notes that are not for public consumption, they're for his own use, so he's kind of very candid, right? And he writes this memo to himself called, I think, on the vices of the political system of the United States, right? And he's trying to understand what went wrong with the Articles of Confederation. And remember, these notes are just for himself, right? But it helps you understand the problem that he's facing. And, he's, and he, he, in, his, in his memo, he he presents a hypothetical society. He says, basically, imagine a world where there are three voters, right? And two of those voters have interests that are aligned against the rights of the third voter. What's gonna happen, right? How are they gonna vote in a direct democracy, a pure democracy? What's gonna happen to the third guy whose rights are gonna be infringed by the interests of the other two? Well, clearly, they're gonna outvote him, right? In a pure democracy, the mob rules. And James Madison, in his notes, said, that the prudence of every man would shun the danger, right? But this brings him to a problem. We just got rid of a king in England and we rejected the idea of monarchy because we said that sovereignty lies in the people, right? 
We want the legitimacy of a government rooted in direct democracy. At the same time, we want to make sure that, uh, that mob rule can't result in rights being taken away from the minority. That's the dilemma that Madison is facing as he's walking into the Constitutional Convention, what becomes the Constitutional Convention here in, in Philadelphia, is how we balance the need for a legitimate democratic institution with the need to protect the rights of minorities. Um, and, uh, and, and the answer to that, in part, is a constitution. So what is a constitution? Um, Justice Scalia once said, a constitution is, uh, in its essence, a constitution tells the current society that it cannot do what it wants to do without going through the extraordinary steps of amending it, right? Um, so that, that at, at its core is what a constitution is, right? It's saying you can't do what you want to do without amending it, and amending it is really hard. So sometimes you'll hear people say that a constitution is counter-majoritarian or anti-majoritarian. I think that's wrong. It's super-majoritarian, right? You can't change the constitution. It just takes a lot of effort, right, to amend it. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to amend it. Well, why would you put that into the system that governs uh, that you've decided to govern you, right? Well, I think it's because, and you see this in all parts of the Constitution, it's because Madison was concerned with this problem. Um, in, uh, in Federalist 10, um, actually, we'll go to Federalist 55. Uh, in, in, in Federalist 55, Madison says something that I think captures the essence of his concern. His concern is that in a fair fight, passion will always beat reason every time. Um, uh, and I, I lost my Federalist 55 quote. Um, but but in, in Federalist 55, he, he basically you know, articulates this concern that passion will always beat reason in a fair fight. So what he wanted to do with the Constitution is make it so there's not a fair fight, right? He wants to give reason a chance to catch up with passion. And so the Constitution includes all of these mechanisms to slow down decision making, right? If you really want to ban 3D printed guns, and other dangerous, uh, allegedly dangerous speech, you can do it, but you have to go through a really onerous process to do it, right? It's slowing down the decision making so you have a chance for reason to catch up with the passionate concerns. That's what a constitution does. Think about various features of, of the constitution that we're familiar with. Separation of powers. Why did we separate, separate powers? So that it's harder to get stuff accomplished, right? We wanna make sure that the majority even though they can accomplish the, the objectives that they, that they want to accomplish, it's possible to do that, but it slows things down when you have three different branches who are involved in the process. If you have two different houses, a, 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 a House of Representatives and a Senate, they have to work together. That slows things down. Federalism, separation of powers between the federal government and the states, that slows things down. So in many respects, that's what a constitution does, is it slows down decision making. That's the, that's the core purpose of this. Um, so, you know, I like to think of a constitution as, as something like uh, filled with, the constitution is filled with speed bumps, right? The purpose of a speed bump is to encourage people to slow down uh, when they're driving through a neighborhood. Now, imagine you were um, an, an alien coming down to Earth and you see this road and you see these big bumps in the middle of it, right? If you don't know the purpose of that bump, if you, if you don't know that it serves the purpose of slowing things down, you might be inclined to say, well, gosh, that seems like uh, a defect. We should get rid of it, right? Pave over the speed bump, get rid of it. Uh, but in doing so, you would have lost the benefit of the speed bump. I think we should be concerned about to what extent, uh, you know, while we're talking about problems uh, and challenges, uh, you know, with, with fake news and everything else, we ought, ought to be concerned about to what extent we have paved over constitutional speed bumps that we've erected in the Constitution? What are the different parts of the Constitution that we have, uh, that are used to slow down decision making? What different parts of the Constitution have we uh, essentially eliminated through judicial decisions or through cultural acquiescence? That's something that I think is worth uh, being careful about and thinking about. Um, but I mentioned that you know, if you don't know what the purpose of the speed bump is, you might be inclined to get rid of it. And this brings me to um, my, my principal concern. Um, James Madison also said that the advancement and diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty, right? A constitution and the speed bumps included in it to protect rights are only as useful as the familiarity with people for the purpose of those speed bumps, right? 
If people don't understand what the Constitution is about, if they don't understand why we protect free speech, it does no good for Josh to get up here and wave the First Amendment. You know, he's got his pocket Constitution, I've got mine. If you don't have uh, your own pocket Constitution, you can download the Constitution Center's interactive Constitution app on your phone and always have it with you. Um, but it does no good for us to wave the First Amendment around and say free speech, free speech is protected by free speech if people don't agree why free speech ought to be protected, right? If people don't understand why that speed bump exists in the first instance, all they're gonna hear is, well, yeah, Josh, but you're letting 3D printed guns be printed everywhere, or you're, you're letting deep fakes or Russian fake news sites affect, uh, affect uh, democratic elections, right? They'll only hear the problem and they won't hear why there's a mechanism that can help address those problems, right? And, and this is, uh, I think, reflected in uh, a recent uh, interview with Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, they were, they uh, had an interview with Mo Rocca, of all people, the other day. It was a fantastic interview. But they were talking about the importance of civic education, right? Of helping people understand why the Constitution exists, why these different parts of the Constitution exist. Not just that. 3D printed gun directions are protected by the First Amendment, but why they ought to be protected by the First Amendment. Um, and, uh, and Justice Gorsuch said, you know, only 25% of people uh, can accurately name uh, all three branches of government. And I think he said that 10% that of people think that Judge Judy is on the US Supreme Court. Um, now, that sounded really low to me. I thought that way more people would think Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court. It turns out it's 10% of, I think, college students or college graduates thinks Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court. I'm guessing that uh, of, the, of the overall population, that number is, is a lot higher, which, you know, as, as Justice Gorsuch said, you know, is not to say anything bad about Judge Judy. She's, she's a fine TV judge, but uh, it does reflect a serious problem, a serious deficit in awareness and familiarity with the why of our Constitution and the what of our Constitution. Um, I'm really excited at the National Constitution Center uh, we're very interested in this question. Um, and we have a partnership with the College Board. You know what the College Board is? The College Board is the organization. It's a, a, it's a C3 nonprofit organization that's responsible for administering the SAT, for example, and the advanced placement courses. So we have a partnership with the College Board to prepare a two-week-long course about the what and the why of the First Amendment that every AP student, doesn't matter if you're an AP biology student or a chemistry student or, or AP history student, after you take the AP exam, you've got two weeks left in the year on average. You gotta do something with that time. So we're working with the College Board to put together this course on the First Amendment, the principles of the First Amendment, the history of the First Amendment, the text of the First Amendment, the different clauses of the First Amendment that teachers will teach, AP teachers will teach in that two weeks that's left of the year uh, to try and help students talk about and discuss and understand why the First Amendment exists in the first instance. What are the reasons for protecting free speech and even controversial sp speech or potentially dangerous speech like the speech that Josh has talked about? Uh, we're really excited uh, to have uh, the participation of, of some wonderful individuals uh, involved in the project. So for example, Justice Kagan recently recorded uh, a video interview with us talking about uh, principles of free speech and why it's important to protect free speech. And we'll be interviewing uh, other, uh, other justices and high profile individuals to include in it to help students have, uh, see from, uh, from legal luminaries, uh, help, help them hear why it's so important to protect these principles. So um, I, I kind of want to end with a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, Abraham Lincoln says, said uh, once that, as the patriots of 76 did to the support of the Declaration of Independence, so to the support of the Constitution and laws, let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor let reverence for the laws become the political religion of the nation. So I think it's insufficient for us to say that the, free, the, the First Amendment and free speech protect something. We need to go the next step and explain to people why we think it ought to. And that's my remarks. All right. Oh. I'm sorry, man. It's OK. Uh, that's a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot from that. He's in your eye. Yeah, yes, sir. What's your name? Carlos. Carlos, thanks for the question.
Yeah. That's what I'm telling you. We got to get him a 3D printer. Model price. Okay, so the question was about registration of homemade guns. Um, under federal law, you don't have to. Um, California has passed a law that requires homemade guns to be registered with a serial number. I haven't made up my mind on those. I think I can be persuaded either way. What I can say, though, with, with clarity is that while you can regulate the ultimate product, you can't regulate the files used to make the product. Um, so regulate the end user, not the person who shares the information. Most people download these files and never actually make the gun. It's a simple, simple fact. Um, let me give another more fun example. If 3D printing gets to the point where it's so effective, the concern isn't going to be about guns, it's going to be intellectual property. So I'll give you an easy example. Let's say I can print the little LeBron James sneakers for $3. They look exactly like the same thing made in China in a sweatshop somewhere, right? Nike is going to care about that. Right, let's say I can make a new you know, Louis Vuitton handbag that looks exactly the same for $4 in, in, in parts. You can 3D print leather. Right? The boutiques are going to care about that. So I think the, the first actual issue that will raise implications on 3D printing is IP. And the manufacturers are going to try to work with the printers to in, input like a, a digital rights management. So for example, if you try to download certain files on a Comcast internet account, they'll say you can't download that, it's pirated. By the same extension, if you try to print certain files on the 3D printer, say sorry, eh, eh, you can't print that, it's prohibited. And that's sort of technology that can be used to limit guns. They haven't done this yet, but 3D printers can say if we have a filter on it, we won't print a gun file. If you ever try to make a photocopy of currency, of US currency, it will not work. The uh, Treasury works with Xerox and Canon to put these little micro codes in currency. And if you try to make a copy of it, it picks up the code and spits out an error message. Everybody in this room is going to go try this now. You can try, it won't work. I'm telling you, it won't work. Um, and I think similar fingerprints might be given to three gun files that they will not print them. That, I think, is a much more likely way of limiting the production of 3D guns. Yes, Carlos? <coughs> of course they will. Of course they will. They can hack it. Right? Which is why I think this entire exercise is one of futility. Um, uh, you know, government exists to regulate. That's why the government exists. And as long as people have a desire to create objects, they'll find ways to evade those restrictions. Um, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be a lot cheaper to just buy a gun on the streets of Philadelphia for not very much money. No background check, nothing. Um, if you want to go and print a gun, you're really going out of your way. Um, but I suppose at some point, maybe it'll be easier. I don't know. Sheldon, you want anything? I didn't know you could 3D print leather. I'm wondering how the cows feel about that. You can, th uh, you can 3D print just about any material. It it's synthetic, and then they, they can, I mean, the fake Louis Vuitton bags aren't actually leather. <laughs> but you, you can 3D print just about anything. In fact, Kanye West, our Lord and Savior, actually said to the Kardashians, he said, I'm afraid of 3D printing. He's a smart guy. He knows if people can 3D print the Yeezy sneakers, they don't have to wait six months for them. And they look exactly the same. You can 3D print a house. You can 3D print anything. Yeah, I've seen the, the, the um, videos or the, the stuff about you know, the possibility of 3D printing homes as a way to kind of you know, do, uh, if you want to start setting up a um, yeah. habitat on Mars. Or exactly, you're exactly. Gonna, you're going to set up big, huge 3D printers and have everything and ready for you. Right, right. exactly. Other questions? Might be a little bit Jude? There are already been attempts to create fakes of current consumer products with 3D prints? Uh, I don't know if the technology is good enough to make it look realistic. I mean, you can have a fake you know, gun, right? You, know, you can have fake products, 
but the sort of level of detail for a consumer product, I don't think it's quite there yet, but um, I'm confident that at some point they'll be. Maybe like an official NFL football or something like that. You could. I mean, again, it's cheaper to just bootleg it and, and buy it in China, right? But if you're talking about like a, an expensive sneaker, an expensive bag that might cost $10,000, right, for an expensive handbag, then it might be worth a 3D printer. Yeah, true. So, some of the arguments that the state attorney general are using in the case against the most distributed, mm -hmm. like nuisance and different issues like that, they seem yeah. to apply to other things besides just 3D guns. So, for example, if someone was saying speech that was offensive to people and causing a nuisance, you could technically apply something, maybe not that exact that thing. Yeah, so when we were sued over the summer, the New Jersey Attorney General argued that putting a file on the internet was a common law nuisance. The same way if you made too much smoke in your backyard or had too much noise. Um, it's a ridiculous argument. But they take the position that speech that might harm others is a common law nuisance then the states have a wide area to regulate speech on the internet in ways that are unthinkable. Um, the crazy part is the judge who actually ruled in our favor seemed to be sympathetic to the idea that putting a file on the internet could be a nuisance because it could lead to harm in the community. That's an insane argument and if it's accepted, states can then basically shut down the internet one after the other. Um, there's also issues of federal preemption. There are laws which protect people who post files on the internet, section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So virtually all these common law suits should be preempted. And I think, my opinion, when we get to the Supreme Court, we're not going to the First Amendment grounds, we're going to win on preemption grounds, either Section 230 or something else, or dormant commerce clause maybe, because states can't regulate commerce in other states. So that's a lot easier way for us to win than the First Amendment, that's my prediction. I'll argue all of them, all of the above. Constitutional down the road. Yeah. What's the timeline on that? So when will the fifth I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, well, we're, we're in the district court. We'll be following stuff soon. I hope by the uh, by summer of 2020. I mean, by summer of 2019, we have a cert petition up. That's my hope. I hope it's New Jersey cert petition. We win the court of appeals, but I think by summer of 2019, there'll be a cert petition up one way or the other. So I don't think if we win the if we win the district court, it's not going to go on bonk. But if we lose in the district court, it might go on bonk, and then we'll get a cert petition. But I think by by next summer, we'll be in business. Anything else? Yeah, Carlos. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think there are ways for us to win against the states that don't involve the First or Second Amendment. You have preemption, you have dormant commerce clause. Again, Justice Thomas doesn't believe in the Dormant Commerce Clause, so we actually might lose that vote, which is a bizarre aspect. But I think there are ways for the courts to rule for us on preemption grounds that, are, that, that states can't regulate the internet. And I think that's an issue that would not interest just us, but the Chamber, I think, would be interested in that and other groups, because states shutting that internet commerce is a very big deal. Um, California, for example, has tried to enact net neutrality on its own, which is insane. That one state wants to regulate internet na nationwide, so our case may actually get up first, because that's a complicated beast of a case. So it, it may present a similar issue. Which I think the preemption ground is a, is, a, is a much safer way to win the case. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, of course. No. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I only saw the headline. I have not had a chance to look at it. But um, I saw news about, uh, kind of similar to the, the choke point efforts by the Obama administration, that the New York AG was involved in similar efforts to yeah. suppress uh, credit card transactions for gun sales. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a First Amendment issue, a Second Amendment issue, or both? And what similarities do you see to that and the 3D printing case? Well, let me tell you a story. I think people are leaving, so I'll wrap this up later in a minute. Um, Governor Cuomo called me, personally. So uh, on July 31st, which was the day I argued two TRO motions, about an hour after the judge in Washington entered a nationwide injunction, I get a phone call. It was a restricted phone number. Uh-oh. So I answer, he says, this is Governor Cuomo. 
And he says, you tell your client to take his files down. I'm like, what files? Like, the files. I'm like, which ones? He had no idea what he was talking about. I was messing with him. He's like, the files. And I'm like, judge, I was like, governor, um, about an hour ago, the attorney general of New York entered a nationwide injunction against us. Your attorney general brought the lawsuit. You've already prevailed. He's like, well, she doesn't work for me. I'm like, okay. He's like, yeah, she's independent. He started complaining. And he's like, take the files. I'm like, you already took them down. He's like, well, I want you to take those files. I'm like, okay. I said, tell your lawyer to send me a letter and I'll take it down. Never sent me a letter. We sued him anyway. Um, but I think there's serious First Amendment things. They're trying to stop us from speaking. There's freedom of association aspects in both the uh, gun case and ours because people want to come together and share files. This is an effort to chill and censor speech with state action, and I think it's very unconstitutional. I think I'll, I'll be happy when we get attorney fees from Governor Cuomo's office. <laughs> Show me the money. Anyone else? Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sheldon. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.